soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Amen. Well, we're glad to see you back tonight. Let's bow our heads, ask God to bless in the service tonight, dear Lord. We're thankful for uh, the services this morning and for what you accomplished and did. We thank you for the visitors that were here. Thank you for the service last night and the three that were saved there. Father, we pray that you will bless in this service tonight, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And aren't you thankful we can come just as we are? Would you stand with me as we sing him 170, Now I Belong to Jesus, in 170. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. 
Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity on the last. Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Would you take a moment and greet those around you this evening? Hymn 264, Nothing But the Blood. Hymn 264. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, no 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Wonderful sing. You may be seated. Gus is going to come receive the offering. I, I get these messages on my phone from uh, different news agencies, generally Fox News, to send me these texts. And this last week I had received this text, and I, I had to, most of the time I just dismiss those and close them up. This one was kind of, it was kind of strange, and I, and so I clicked on it. It's about this televangelist and how he was asking his people, he's asking people to donate $54 million to buy himself a private jet. This is his fourth one. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is what people hear that, people hear that and they think, well, you know, they think that, that uh, churches, that's all they want is money. When they hear stuff like that, that's all. That's what they think. Here's a guy, fifty-four million dollars to pri- to buy a private jet for himself. And I'm. Th- I thought to myself, how many people could be reached with fifty-four million dollars? How many Bibles could we send? How many tracts could we send out for fifty-four million dollars? I just. I. I just. I just. I just think it's ridiculous. And. Uh, you know, God's people sacrifice and give, and and then you have something like that happens, and that people are going to look at that. The unsaved world's going to look at that, and they're just going to think that's what Christianity is all about. And some people probably wouldn't even go to church today because of that. I think of the passage there in Second Corinthians in chapter eight. I love this passage because here's some people that gave sacrificially. These folks. There in Macedonia, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. See these churches in Macedonia, these people were so poor, they were suffering, they were persecuted, they didn't have anything, but they were able to give beyond their ability to give. God provided it for them to give uh, because of their faith in the Lord. And they gave, and God blessed, but how were they able to do that? First, they gave themselves, amen? If we don't give ourselves first, then we'll never be able to give unto the Lord like we should. But once you give yourself to the Lord, then uh, then you can serve God, you'll be faithful to God. I, I think that that is the key. I'm, I've been thinking about this for several weeks now. I think one of the keys in the Christian life to being a success is serving the Lord. Once we give ourselves completely to the Lord, without reservation, then you know what? Uh, then God can use us, and I think it helps us overcome all these other issues. I, I see it in my own life. I, you know, I don't worry about all this stuff because I'm busy serving the Lord. And I, don't, I, I just don't take time to think about those things. When we're busy serving God, I think that's the key I think that's the key even for the RU ministry, Reform is Unanimous. I think if these people would come in there, and I, I believe the discipleship is for them to give themselves over to the Lord and serve God, and once they do that, once they're serving the Lord, then they'll not uh, be concerned about all those habits and those things that they have because they're so busy serving the Lord. I think that that will make a difference, difference in their life, and that's the way it was with these Macedonian Christians, but they gave out of their poverty unto the Lord, but first they gave themselves. But I, I think about these people, and I think about others. I think about the people in our church, some people that give sacrificially, and then I think about this guy asking for $54 million. You, you know, I just, it just, uh, I just, I'll tell you, it just ticks me off a little bit, but... Uh, I, 
I just think there's something, uh, so much that can be done for the Lord. I, I just don't feel like we ought to waste the Lord's money. I never have, and I don't think that we should. Nonetheless, uh, we need to continue to give so that we can see our missionaries that we support all around the world continue to preach the gospel. Let's, uh, Pastor Dan, why don't you come up and lead us in prayer for the offering tonight? Let's pray together. Our Father, we're grateful for what you have done in our presence this weekend. We're thankful for the many servants that you have brought here at Liberty Baptist Church. And uh, even as we heard this morning in Sunday school about serving and then again tonight, Lord, we pray that, uh, that many of the believers here would, in fact, graduate to that level of uh, giving of themselves. <clears throat> May we all do that, Lord, on a daily basis. <clears throat> and uh, when our eyes are focused on you and our burdens are in place, not because of sin, but because of uh, burdens, uh, dear Lord, that you place upon us, uh, giving us responsibilities and your eternal plan, uh, everything looks different. And uh, our relationship with you becomes sweeter as we're endeared to you and your power. Lord, we pray that we would, uh, as a church family, grow uh, in this area. And we thank you for the many servants uh, that we have spread abroad tonight as missionaries. And we pray that you would strengthen them this week, and, uh, give them the help they need. And we heard uh, about quite a few of them this morning. Uh, as we listen to the reports. And, and Lord, we pray that they would uh, know thy power and uh, your presence would be evident and that they would uh, see the hand of God working before them and through them. Now, Lord, we ask that you would bless this time of giving. We thank you for the opportunity and be with our service tonight. And may we let the Spirit of God speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> stand one more time this evening as we sing hymn 364, Near the Cross, hymn 364. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find 
Rest beyond the river Near the cross a trembling soul Love and mercy found me There the bright and morning star Sheds its beams around me In the cross, in the cross Be my glory ever Till my raptured soul shall find Rest beyond the river. Thank you. You may be seated. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distressed, till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice, and I entered the haven of rest. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of his word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. The song of my soul since the Lord made me whole has been the old story so blessed of Jesus who will save whosoever will have a home in the haven of rest. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. Oh, come to the Savior, he patiently waits. To save by his power divine. Come anchor your soul in the haven of rest and say, My beloved is mine. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. Amen. The haven of rest is my Lord. 
I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. Well, the children are going to stay in here tonight. We have Bob. Watkins here with us, is here with us uh, for our men's uh, banquet, and uh, we had three saved last night, we praise the Lord for that, and here with us in Sunday school and junior church, and uh, he's not leaving until tomorrow, and, and so we ask him to go ahead and speak for us tonight. He was a pastor for 25 years there in California, he pastored for 25 years, he's only been in full-time itinerant uh, evangelism for just two years. But uh, he has a full schedule going to churches and camps and retreats and all different kinds of things. And, and the Lord is using him. And he has a unique uh, gift to be able to communicate. And so we're glad to have him here with us at Liberty Baptist Church. And uh, I... Hope that you'll give him a warm welcome tonight. Let's give him a warm welcome as he comes tonight. Good night. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to preach. I did press the button, so uh, that microphone should be coming on. All right. How many of you were at the uh, dinner last night? How many of you were? Okay, thank you. Uh, very good. How many of you were at Sunday school this morning? Oh, wow, very good i got to tell you, too, this is a great Sunday night crowd. God bless you. Uh, keeping, keeping faithful to the right kinds of things through the years. Lord bless Liberty Baptist Church of Sarasota, Florida. That's tremendous. So I need to tell you, just uh, for those who may not have been with us last night or this morning, so everything you're about to see could be explained. There's no uh, sorcery, wizardry, or even magic effect. We call these gospel effects. Gospel FX. That's what we call them. Gospel effects. And they're object lessons. Years ago, pastors would have what they called children's messages, children's sermons. And they'd invite the boys and girls to the front rows. And pastors would do object lessons. Some of them even delved into a uh, sleight of hand in order to keep the attention of the children and the adults. And with that, they began to do what they call gospel illusions. We try to stay away from the word magic. It has a whole different uh, meaning, of course, in Scripture and is often related to things that we should not have anything to do with. So it just makes sense. Gospel affects something through which we could illustrate the gospel. Now, let me start with this. Usually, it's best if something has a sort of an emotional investment. And some people get emotional about things like money. I need to borrow a $1 bill. Is there somebody that would lend me a $1 bill? You have to hold it up, though, so I could see it, make sure it's hearty. Somebody would lend me a $1 bill. This must be a Baptist church because nobody's reaching for their wallet. So what? If I had a $1 bill, it'd be in missions, man. It'd be in the offering. Let me take a look here, sir. Thank you so much. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, yes. That'll, that'll work out just perfectly. And then is there somebody, uh, a young person between 10 and 12 years of age that would help me out? A young person between 10 and 12 years of age? Would you help me out there? Come and help me out there, guy. Appreciate that. And what was your name? Jordan. That's right, Jordan. Come on up here and help me out. All right. Very good. Yeah, appreciate that. Thanks for being willing to help me out. We'll go to this side. We can still see from over here, right? All right, Jordan. Jordan, $1 bill. What I need you to do, I need you to take this. I need you to fold it over like that. Would you do that for me, please? And give it a crease. Just fold it over and give it a good crease. All right, good. And then fold it end to end. Fold it end to end. Nice, nice. Okay. And what was your name, sir? Larry. Larry has lent me the dollar bill. I have given it to Jordan here to fold and all that. Would you please hand me the dollar bill? All right. Nothing has happened. Is this a dollar you gave me? Thank you so much. You may have a seat. I need a $50 bill. No, I'm just kidding. Jordan, come back up here. Come back up here. 
that's just cheap. That's what that is. That's just cheap. I don't, shouldn't do those kinds of things. But anyway, got to buy groceries somehow, huh? All right. Every dollar bill, of course, uh, has a serial number on it. This is no different. It has one printed there. In fact, it has one there and there. So what I need you to do is I need you to look at that serial number. I'm going to write it on a coin envelope here, a coin envelope, and it starts with a letter. What is the letter that that starts with? L, okay? And what's the next number? Two. And keep on going. Four. One. Zero. Four. Go ahead. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. L, 24104358T. Would you uh, cap that for me, please? And I will take the dollar. Okay, I'm going to put it in here. All right, very good. Did you have dinner tonight? It's too early for dinner, isn't it? You had lunch, though. All right. Okay, good, good. The reason I ask is when we have had lunch, it's a little easier to seal the envelope with saliva. Would you just lick that there? Just go ahead and lick the envelope. Seal it there. Now, the last guy that licked it didn't have a problem. Go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. All right. You could hold it like that then. Just hold it like that. Pinch it. Hold it up to the light there. I'll take this. And make sure, make sure that the contents remain. Okay. So we're holding up the light. Okay, good. I need a young lady to help me out. A young lady that's between the ages of, uh, say, 8 and 12. 8 and 12. Young lady between the ages of 8 and 12. Is there a young lady that would be willing to help me out? You would have a real easy part. You don't have to lick anything. All right? Somebody help me? Going once? Going twice? Is there somebody to help me out? Do I, am I missing a hand? Somebody raise it up high? Raise it. Would you help me? Oh, come on and help me out. I appreciate that so much. Appreciate that so much. All right. Cool. And if you'll come right on over here, and we'll come over to this side. We'll come over to this side. And what is your name again? Um, I'm sorry? Ayla. Ayla? How do you spell that? Oh, that's beautiful. It is Ayla. Cool. I have here these lemons. You ever go shopping with mom? Probably every once in a while. All right, so I have these lemons. I, Ayla, would you point to a hand? Point to a hand. Point to any hand. Preferably one of these two. This one. Okay. <laughs> hold that. And then uh, uh, let's see here. Sir, would you hold on to that lemon for me, please? Thank you very much. And I need, oh, good hands. All right. Hi, you were all over it, though, man. Hey, you're not letting that get away. Appreciate that. Would you hold on to that for me, please, sir? Thank you very much. Okay. Now then, uh, Ayla, 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 Ayla. I have a bag. I have a bag right here. Go ahead and put the lemon in the bag. Nicely done. And then hold that bag shut. Excellent. One of my favorite types of effects is what's called a translocation, where something goes from one place to another. So here's what I propose to do. I'm going to take this dollar bill out of this envelope in a mysterious way. I'm going to put it into one of those three lemons, the dollar bill into one of those three lemons. Now, there's a great gospel truth illustrated by such things, and that is this. When you and I were born, we were born into sin's bondage. We were enveloped by sin. Enveloped. That's a coin envelope. I know, I'm putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. And should we die in our sin, we miss heaven forever. Uh, and we spend eternity in the lake of fire separated from God, separated from his mercies, from his grace, from his patience, separated from any goodness from God's hand for eternity separated from him. When a person trusts Christ as their savior, that position changes, praise be to God. We're taken out of our sin and we're placed into Christ. It wasn't something we felt happen necessarily. We say, oh, I'm being taken out of my sin. Oh, I'm being placed in the Lord. But that is a spiritual position. And the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so this is a minor illustration of a major Bible truth. A dollar bill removed from an envelope and placed into a lemon. The truth illustrated, when we, are, when we trust Christ as our Savior, we're taken out of our sin and we are placed into Christ. All right, go ahead and hold that up there. I'm going to make a mysterious move here. I mean, to get the dollar bill out of the envelope, that would be a great trick. Why, that would be impossible. Here we go. A wave of the hand. A mysterious move. Did you feel it? Did you feel it going to the lemon? No? Okay. Thanks for playing along. All right, I'll try it again. Hold it up to the light. Yeah, okay, still see. Okay. A mysterious move. Still nothing? All right. The thing is, she's enjoying that, all right? <laughs> like, okay, once again, a mysterious move. Still nothing. 
All right. Well, and hold it up there. See, that's the problem. I still see it there, too. Here's, sometimes things don't work. You always count on at least at some point something's not going to work. So you have to go to plan B. Unfortunately, Jordan, I'm going to have to make that vanish another way. So go ahead and take it out of the envelope and place it in my hand. I'm going to have to make it vanish another way and go into the lemon. All right? So if you'll just take the dollar bill out. All right? What? The lemon. Really? Open that up. Let's see what it says. Here, I'll take that envelope. What's it say? I am your yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Signed by the state of California. <laughs> That's how they were paying people with those IOUs. What a great state. Okay. Well, here, hold on to that. Let's see if we can. Maybe it worked. What? Maybe it worked. So now I need somebody that's maybe between the ages of 12 to uh, 16 to help me, 12 to 17, somebody uh, in that age group that could help me out, somebody that could help me out, somebody could help me out, going once, going twice, Maya, Maya, oh, hey, young man, a gentleman on the end, hey, everybody my age is a young man, but usually young men don't have this, so uh, I can't say that, all right, I'm just jealous, what is your name, Devin, Devin? good to meet you, all right, if you'll stand right there for a moment, here's what I have for Devin, for Devin, yes, Devin, I have this. Okay, I know it's like awesome, isn't it? Oh, I have this also. Okay, so Devin, very, very sharp blade. You think? Okay, so um, I'll need you to hold the handle with one hand, hold this blade with the other. Very good. In a moment, I'm going to come at you. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be pushing against the blade. You can put one foot in back of you. Uh, so that you can get braced, because we're going to cut a lemon there. All right, all right, good, good, good. You're set. All right, you still have the lemon there? Do you have all that? Okay, sir, toss me the orange. On the count of three, one, two. <laughs> it's okay, I'll get it. <sighs> oh. Thanks for playing along. All right. <laughs> Let's see if it worked. One lemon, and we're going to go ahead and cut it open. Yellow is lemon. Pink is Rob. Okay, here we go. And is there a dollar bill? Okay, good. <laughs> good, good, good. And you have that lemon, sir, on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, nicely done. Very good. You've been practicing. And <gasps> would you take the lemon out of the bag for me, please, Ayla? Okay. Here we go. Let's see. When you and I take the Lord as our personal Savior, we are safer in Him than money is in the bank. This has a special combination. Three to the right. Two to the left. Three to the right. I just think that's cool. We don't even have to look to see, right? We, well, but we will. Would you lay that bag out on your hand flat? Just lay it out on your hand flat. Perfect. Would you unroll that on that bag, please, for me? All right. You may have a seat. Thank you so much, Devin, for helping me out. Give him a hand for not cutting me. All right. Are you able to unroll it? Here, I'll help you. Okay. Now, it has an identifying serial number. You still have the envelope? Okay. What's the first letter on this dollar bill? L. And what do you have? L. L. First number? Six. What do you have? What do you have? We have a match. Very good. Let me grab my wallet here. Thank you so much. Ayla, could you do me a favor? On the way down, would you give this gentleman back this dollar bill? Because that other one's all lemony. It'll make my wallet smell very good. 
Give her a hand for helping me out. Nicely done, young lady. And sir, I will take the IOU, and I will take the envelope. Jordan, thank you very much. You may have a seat as well. Give him a warm round of applause because he has a seat. I love that. A Bible illustration, a, a minor illustration of a major Bible doctrine. So good stuff. Now, as a ventriloquist, as I mentioned last night in the, uh, in the, the dinner, I like to think out of the box a little bit. And I remember about 10 years ago, I ran across something. I was, I was uh, uh, researching, doing some research and development for some vent things. And, and I ran across this, and I thought, oh, that is so cool. And I found a guy in the Philippines that accommodated what it was that I was looking for. And it was a wonderful prop. And it gave me the opportunity to, to do some research into putting words in somebody else's mouth. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of an ability, putting words into somebody else's mouth? Now, growing up, I, there were times where um, my sisters would be sitting there, and I'd think, well, they need to get in trouble a little bit, so I'd make them say a little something, and they'd look at me and hit me, and, uh, and then they would get in trouble for saying what they said. So, um, so I thought, this will be fun. Let's put words in somebody's mouth. So I wonder if there's somebody that might be um, able to volunteer somebody else or somebody that would say, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. Or things. Um, let's see here. Sir, could you help me out, please? Would you come and help me with the beard? Yes, yes, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. Do you two know each other? That's your dad? Oh, oh, you get to go to church with your dad. Oh, you did a great job in Children's Church this morning. Thank you so much. And what is your name, sir? Phil. 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 Hey, Phil, do you mind if I use you for this little experiment? Is it, okay, if you'll come stand right here, please, that would be great. And then um, just look straight ahead. I'm going to tap right here. Is that okay if I tap you there? Sure. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to tap you there. And each time I do, if you'll open and close your mouth, you don't have to form the words. Just open and close your mouth. Just look toward the light. Don't go toward the light, but look, because... <laughs> That's a different thing, and that's really bad theology, too. All right, so, so, although it does say exit, I wonder what that means. All right, so anyway, so, um, so I'll just tap here. I'll tap once. Okay, good. A little delay. That's okay. That's okay. I'll tap twice. Okay. I'll tap, I'll tap, I'll tap three times. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm just hesitating now just to see if he'll open and close his mouth. That's so much fun. All right, so we'll try this uh, uh, once and then twice and three times. Hi. Oh, good. My name. <laughs> You're the ventriloquist. I didn't see your lips move. That's amazing. <laughs> Mine were moving like crazy. Okay. <laughs> Hi. My name is Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> hey, I have some tape. Let me try this with some tape. This will be fun. Because what we'll do is I'll, I'll take some tape off, and we'll put it right here on your lip. And then if you'll just hold your mouth closed but keep the lip still, it's really funny because you can try this at home. You can try it not on your dog, but you can try this at home, and then it just wiggles the lip and stuff. It's so hilarious. It's like a little string there. Okay, what do I do with the tape? Okay. All right, that would have been hilarious, though. Uh, would have been a lot of fun. You could just imagine. So let's take this to the next level. If you'll turn and face me, please. If you'll turn and face me, that'd be great. All right. Good, good, good. Boom. Usually I have music. That's okay. I'm going to mute that. Whoop, let me get in there. Phil, you know, I don't know why churches don't do this to their visitors. That would be, <laughs> that'd be memorable. 
Hey, how you doing? Oh, this is fantastic. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Good. <laughs> we didn't plan this out. We did not plan this out. Did? No. Okay. I would have lurked in the nursery. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but are you having fun? This is magical. Yeah. Magical. Woo! Good. All right, so you are having a good time. I am living the dream. Yes, you are living the dream. All right, you like uh, being in front of people? Well, not really, but I have dreams of this moment. <laughs> really, well, if you could be in front of a congregation, what would you? Oh, I would sing. Oh, that special tonight was awesome. I would, I love to sing, yeah? Can you really sing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got this. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> so... Uh, um, would we recognize the song? Oh, it's a classic. Oh, it is. But it's not in the uh, hymn books. Okay. It's in the modern ones. Oh, it is. Okay. But not the uh, old ones. Okay. Anything you have to do for this? I have to get into position. Oh, what do you have to do? My right hand goes on my hip like this. Okay. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Oh, my glasses. I dropped them. Here you go. You could put those in your pocket. And then, and my left hand goes in the air, like this. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Okay, good. I am ready. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's great. I can't feel my face. I know it's, yeah, it's okay. <clears throat> I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle. See, I wiggled that. That was good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been working on that. Okay, in the mirror. Good, all right. Here is my spout. When I get all steamed up. <laughs> steamed up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I worked on that too. <laughs> Here we shout. Tip me over and pour me out. Oh, that's wonderful. You were delightful. I shall relieve you of this misery. Thank you so much. God bless you. Oh. No. Oh. I'm telling you, we need to travel together, Phil. That has got to be the most delightful I have ever seen that done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And th there's a, there is actually a Bible application to all of that. You know, God desires for us to be his mouthpiece, doesn't he? There are times I'll take a puppet after I've used him and everything, and I'll lay him across my hand. No hand in there, no power, no strength. And he just lays there. I don't do that for children's church. It's a little traumatic for them. Uh, but I'll just lay it across there. There's no power. And Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. He didn't say, without me, you can do very little. He said, without me, you can do nothing. And so the life filled with the Spirit of God gives God the opportunity to speak through that life. A man once said, preach at all times. Preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. Fascinating. We have a tendency to think in boxes, have a tendency to think in paradigms, and that's helpful because this way we don't have to spend all day ruminating over certain decisions and things we think in certain frameworks I'll, I'll tell you about a couple they'd been married for quite some time the pressures of life were pretty heavy with the bills and things and her birthday was coming up and so he was laying in bed reading a book and she was brushing her teeth and he looked over the glasses and he could see where she was and he asked her the question he said you know your birthday's coming up what would you like for your birthday and she just nonchalantly said to be six again. Well, man, he tucked that away. He tucked that away. Six years old, no responsibilities. Everything's taken care of. You can eat what you want. You can play. You can do whatever you want. It's six years old. So the wheels started turning. He, he called her boss, got the day off of work for her, and he said, now dress actively because well, I've got a busy day planned for us. And that morning they got up. They, he had Lucky Charms cereal. He had donuts on the table chocolate milk yuck all those things you know and so she said what's this he said look no questions asked this is what you said and then they went to an amusement park they rode all the little kids rides went around and around and up and down and spinning around and and uh then they had lunch they had the corn dog and the and the funnel cake all that stuff you're not supposed to eat you know at our age 
And then, uh, then they went on more rides, you know, and Jesus just getting dragged along through all of this. And then they stopped for a happy meal on the way home. And, at the, and then at the end of the day, I mean, they're just, they're shell-shocked. They just plop on the bed. They're still, still clothed from the day. And so he wanted to know how he did. So he said, so tell me, tell you what, what was it like to be six again? And she leaned up on her elbow. She said, is that what this was about? He said, well, yeah. She said, I was talking about my dress size. <laughs> Man. And that just goes to show us, men, even when we listen, we still get it wrong, don't we? <laughs> well, we should listen anyway. And so what happens a lot of times is we think in these boxes, and that can be especially dangerous when, it, when we begin to think of God in boxes that are not scriptural, that are not biblical. And there are times when God does not behave very God-like according to our boxes, according to our frame of thinking. And there was a man that was wrestling with that. His name means wrestler. He's found in the Old Testament... And his name is Habakkuk. If I could, could I direct your attention to the book of Habakkuk tonight for the next few moments? Habakkuk was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Israel. It was called Judah after it had divided from the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And Habakkuk was a type of prophet. He's, of course, in the minor prophets. We know our Old Testament is not laid out according to chronology. chronology. It's, it's laid out according to genre. So Habakkuk is a minor prophet, not because he didn't make it to the big leagues, but because his work is simply um, smaller in volume than Isaiah, and Jeremiah, uh, and Ezekiel, and Daniel. So Habakkuk, a minor prophet, preaching to the southern kingdom, and God's opening his eyes to the wickedness and the sin that is there. And, and yet he seems, it seems that every time he goes to God to talk about this wickedness and this sin, God's just not doing anything. It's as though God is deaf or the heavens are brass. And he asks the question, how long, O oh Lord, will you open my eyes to these things and then not do anything about the wickedness, the oppressors, those taking advantage of the down and the outers? Well, he's not the first one in the Old Testament to ask that question. Jeremiah asked the same question. And the question had to do with the wicked who prosper. Asaph had the same issue in the, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 72 uh, or 73. Asaph had the same issue. Um, he, the issue was, why is it that the wicked prosper? When I saw that the wicked were prospering, I said, I have cleansed my hands in vain. But then Asaph realized, realized that, the, that the wicked did not have the God that he had. He had a God who would hold him up. He had a God who would lead him. He had a God who would guide him. He had a God who would provide for him. It was Psalm 73. So Habakkuk sees the wickedness, and he asks God about doing something about it. And then God tells Habakkuk, I'll tell you what I'll do. And when I tell you, you're not going to believe it. And you know, he didn't, because it seemed so out of character for God to do what he said he was going to do. It seems contrary to God's character. And there are times when God seems to behave in a way that's outside of what we understand God to be. But I found that Habakkuk applied a fourfold remedy to his situation. And that fourfold remedy, I believe, could be an encouragement to us tonight. Well, there are times when things happen to God's children and we say, Lord, I wouldn't let that happen to my own child. And you are a heavenly father that is loving. Well, how could you let us go through that as your children? It seems there are times where God may not behave very godlike. And we learn from Habakkuk what we do during those circumstances. There was a little boy about four years old playing in a sandbox his dad has built. His dad had built. And while he's playing in the sandbox, he's doing a road construction project as all boys do in sandboxes. He was digging tunnels. He was uh, using rocks as cars, branches as trucks, twigs as trucks. But he ran into an obstacle. There was a huge rock there. And so he tried to dig under it. He couldn't dig under it. It was just too big for his strength. He tried to lift it. He couldn't lift it. He kicked at it. He couldn't move it with his feet. It was just there. And he was so frustrated because of this rock in his sandbox. And finally, in frustration, he just threw himself back and 
pounded his arms against the sand and, sand and kicked his feet in frustration. His father, sitting on the porch, reading, looked over his book, saw what the boy was doing. We're going to leave that little boy there, that four-year-old boy. I hope I remember he's there before we're done. Sometimes he's been there for years. <laughs> but we're going to leave him there for a moment because the fact of the matter is sometimes there's a rock in our sandbox and it doesn't make any sense. And it's beyond our strength to handle it. Habakkuk's in that condition. Look at me, Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning of verse 1. The Bible says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Now God answers Habakkuk. Notice what he says in verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. And he describes the brutality, he describes the swiftness, he describes the strength of these Chaldeans. So God says to Habakkuk, oh, I've heard your prayer, prophet of mine. I've heard your prayer. And over on the horizon of history, there's a nation there, the Chaldeans. And I'm raising them up, and they will come against this nation against which you are prophesying. They'll come against this nation that's, that's laden with sin and iniquity. They'll come against this nation. Now Habakkuk has another issue to wrestle with. Because in this sense, God is not acting very godlike. And Habakkuk addresses this. Look here in verse, verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast ordained them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Here's the situation Habakkuk is wrestling with. Lord, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. How is it that you could use a treacherous, wicked nation against us? I mean, we're bad, but we're not as bad as they are. How could you use a wicked nation against those who are more righteous than that wicked nation? Lord, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. And so in this, Habakkuk applies this four-fold procedure for dealing with those times when God doesn't make sense. Number one, Habakkuk remembered. The first thing he remembered were the things that he knew about God. The first thing he ran to was his theology. Boy, that's great, because theology is life. Life is theology. We live what we believe, and, and it shows up. We believe what we live. Life, as somebody said just recently that um, we do not, we, we, we're not to practice what we preach. We find ourselves instead preaching what we practice. We do that, don't we? we our lives... Uh, preach through the practice they preach what we really believe and so Habakkuk goes to his theology and there's some things he knows about God and these are good things and you and I that's what we need to do when God drops a rock in our sandbox or when we're moving along and we see there's a rock there and our progress is stopped and we just do not understand this thing that's beyond our strength it's a it's a it's a dark cloud it's a stormy cloud it's a difficulty it's a trial and we wonder, Lord, what is it that you're doing in my life? What's going on here? The first thing we do is we run back to what we know about God. And we know some amazing things. We know that God is good. He is. His thoughts toward us are not evil. God is good. He's not out to destroy us. Praise God. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. 
He is a God who loves us. Our shepherd is a good shepherd. He has given us abundant life. And God will never put more on us than we're able to take. And he measures with the greatest precision. Never, never a milligram more than what's necessary, nor a milligram less than what he has deemed wise. An amazing God that we have. So we run to our theology. We run. Now that means I need to know something about God. The people in the Bible that knew God, there were some things that they that, that were that were woven into the fabric of their lives. Guys that knew God, guys that knew God, women who knew God, not simply knew about him, not those who could sniff out heresy 15 miles away, though, but the people who knew God, this knowledge affected them. We find that they had great thoughts of God, great thoughts of God, not little mean thoughts of God, great thoughts of God. People that knew God in the Bible had great thoughts about God. Not only did they have great thoughts about God, they also had great calm in difficult circumstances. A great example of this are the three Hebrew young men who were about ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace for taking a stand. They were about to be thrown in the fiery furnace, and they said, we are not careful to answer the old Nebuchadnezzar. We're not nervous about this. We're not frightened about this. You do not scare us. Our God can deliver us. Great thoughts about God. Our God can deliver us from your fiery furnace. Lord's not wringing his hands saying, oh, a fiery furnace, what are we going to do? God can deliver us. But know this, if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow before your image. They had great calm in the midst of the difficulty. Why? Because they knew God. And they had great thoughts about God because they knew God. I love that. And they did great exploits because they knew God as well. So Habakkuk, Habakkuk, the wrestler, runs to his theology. When it seems like God is going to do something that's not very godlike, he runs to his theology. The second thing he does in this fourfold process is he applies his theology to his situation. He applies his theology to his situation. Now, to a degree, some of the wrinkles got ironed out. We read it in verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine holy one? And he says, we shall not die. He says, okay, Lord, I see what you're doing. You have made promises to Israel. You are not going to cause us to be extinct. We shall not die. But you have instead ordained the Chaldeans for judgment. You have ordained them. You have ordained them for judgment. He talks about that here. You have established them for correction. All right, so, so, so we take our theology about God and we apply it to our situation. Now, in some circles, it's academically intellectual to live in slippery places. That's a hard way to live. I, went to, I, I grew up in Huntington Beach, California, surfing capital of the world. I did not surf because <laughs> there were these things called sharks. So I, di I didn't surf, but, but, um, but I grew up in Huntington Beach, and while I was growing up there, we never, we never had it snow in Huntington Beach. I don't understand. It never snowed in Huntington Beach. Now, I'm sure it has at some point, because there's all these anomalies that happen, but it didn't snow while I was there. So my first encounter with snow was at Bible College. I was in Springfield, Missouri. I was there, for, I was there at that college for one year back in uh, 1976, 1976-77. I know you're thinking, dude, you are like ancient. I know. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they say in California. Dude, you're like ancient. So I, I come out of my dorm. I'm going to, going to catch a bus to go to church, and there's snow on the ground. I thought, oh, this is, this is amazing. I'm there. What's it like to walk in? So, whoops, boom, I'm on the ground. My shoes were very slick. The soles were. And I thought, oh, how do people walk on this stuff? And, uh, of course, I looked around to see if anybody saw me. Uh, because of the embarrassment factor. So I found that I, what I needed to do to avoid, the, to avoid the slippery places, I needed to step on clumps of grass that were sticking up through or, or rocks that were sticking up through the snow or a piece of the sidewalk where the snow had melted and gone away. And so I would step on those, those places. Some people, they live on the slippery places. That's a dangerous place to be. And you will eventually fall. You'll eventually fall. Now, look, it's, it's fun from time to time to delve into areas we may not have all the answers to to delve into areas that are still mysterious. But we can't live in those areas or we're going to fall. Got to stand on the, sh on the sure theology of the Word of God. The things that are obvious, that's what we stand on. And so Habakkuk did that. Ran to his theology, remembered what he believed about God, that is, and then he applied it to his situation. Some of the wrinkles get ironed out, but not all of them got ironed out for Habakkuk. And sometimes they don't 
iron out all of our wrinkles. So what does he do then? The next thing he does is he watches. The third thing is he watches. All right, so there are some wrinkles still. How could you use the wicked, violent, treacherous Chaldeans to accomplish your will? You're a holy God. They're an unholy people. How can they be tools in your hands? And so he watches. In fact, chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I'm going to watch and see what God does. I'm just going to submit to him and watch and see what he does. And he, he may call me on this, but I'm going to just be still and watch and listen for his voice and, and see what he does. And that's what we need to do. Sometimes we like to push things, don't we? Sometimes we like to make things happen. And there are times where that's very appropriate. But sometimes it's not. I remember a guy who, uh, when he would go to work every day before work, he'd pass by a donut shop. And he would stop in, get donuts for himself and for those who worked with him. And one day the donuts stopped. And he said, well, what's the matter? He said, I'm on a diet. So no more donuts for a while. And sure enough, he was faithful to his diet. No donuts for a while. But after about two months, one day the people came in the office and said there were donuts there. What, they said, what are these donuts here? We thought you were on a diet. He says, well, I am. But I want you to know I prayed about this. As I drove by the donut shop, I said, Lord, if it's your will, because I really would like some donuts and if it's your will, may there be a parking space open right there in front of the donut shop. And what do you know? The fourth time around the block, there it was. <laughs> We're kind of like that, aren't we? We're kind of like that, kind of pushing God's will. To, but Habakkuk, he was going to be still. He was going to watch what God would do. And the final thing he was going to do was no matter what God did, he was going to trust because of the theology that he knew, he was going to trust. And that's the fourth thing, he was going to trust. And as you go through here in verse 4, the Bible says, Behold, his soul is lifted up, uh, excuse me, behold, his soul, which is lifted up and is not upright in him. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. This is what the Lord says to Habakkuk, as Habakkuk is watching. The soul of the Chaldean. Was not, was not right. The soul was not upright. But then God says this to Habakkuk, but the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. That gets echoed two times on the pages of the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. So Habakkuk, you ran to what you remembered about God. You ran back to your theology, good theology. You applied it to your situation. Some of the wrinkles were ironed out. Good, good, good. But there were still some things that kind of stuck. What would you do then? I'm going to watch and see what God's going to do. And in the long run, I'm going to trust him. That's the fourth thing. I'm going to trust him. Because that's the thing. The just shall live by faith. We've all had a rock dropped in our sandbox. Look, nobody gets out of this life without some trauma. Some of you have had multiple traumas. Some of you have had multiple storms, storm upon storm upon storm. For some of you, you really don't know what a childhood is like. Maybe you grew up in a house where there was a health crisis. Maybe you grew up in a house where there was a, a financial reversal that pulled the rug out from under everybody. For some of you, you had to grow up a little bit more quickly. If you did not mother your siblings, they would not have a mother. And you weathered all of their, their difficulties and their resistance toward your leadership. They didn't realize how good they had it with you there, but you weathered that. Nobody gets out of this life without a trauma. We were moving through life pretty well. I have five children, three boys and two girls. And I often wondered if there was a trauma that came to our home. If sorrow visited our home, what would the result be what would happen. Because as a pastor, I watched as sorrows would visit certain families and somehow, some way for the honor of God, they would be propelled forward and be more effective in serving the Lord. And I watched as others would crumble. What would happen to us? Would we crumble? 
or would we stay faithful? And when people crumble, people understand, well, you know, they just haven't been the same since such and such happened. They haven't been the same since they faced such and such a trial. People understand. But would we be faithful? October 15th in the year 2005, it's been a little while now. But you know how those traumas are. You relive them again and again. At our place in beautiful Yucca Valley, California, we're at about 3,200 to 4,200 feet elevation. We're about 30 miles north of Palm Springs. Where we live, it's a little, little rural. I mean, our streets are paved. We don't have curbs and gutters and sidewalks. We never once did our children ever hear us say, hey, when the street light comes on, come on in the house. Never heard us say that. They'd still be out in the street playing. And I say all that to say this, when the sun goes down, it can be dark on a moonless night. And on that particular night, it just seemed particularly dark. At about 8.30 at night, there's a ring of our doorbell. And I look out through the little peephole, and standing on the other side of the threshold is an army captain and an army chaplain. We are nowhere near an army base. And I turned on the porch light so I could see more clearly. And out on the street is that black walled tires, tinted windows, government car. And I opened the door and the captain said, are you one of the parents of specialist Timothy Watkin? And I thought, this can't be good. And I said, I am. He said, may we come in, we have some news about your son. And so we came in, we invited them in. My other four children were home at the time. They were home. We gathered around the table. My wife and I sat in some chairs there at the table. The dining room table is a little bit higher. And the chairs are kind of more like the high stools and things, so we're sitting there. And they began to tell us how that earlier that day in Ramadi, Iraq, while Iraqis were voting on a new constitution, my son and his unit were in a hot spot and they were on combat maneuvers he was in a Bradley fighting vehicle and an improvised explosive device was detonated and shredded the back end of that vehicle they had beefed it up with armor but the insurgents just beefed up their explosives it was like a never ending game and my son and four of his friends went into eternity in an instant. As they, as they began to talk to us about these things, I remember our son had been deployed to Iraq in January, came home in August to spend some time with us as a family. And, and really, during that time, he was home for two weeks. He saw all kinds of people. He had worked in Christian camp ministry. He had gone to uh, uh, Bob Jones University, had gone to a school where we are in, uh, in Southern California called Pacific Baptist College. He had friends from other colleges that he'd met at camp. He knew people all across the United States. He'd bought himself a car. And, uh, and then he went back. And when he went back to Iraq, I got a, a phone call from him in September. And he told us about a sergeant of theirs, a man's man. A guy had been on watch for over 24 hours and this uh, sergeant came and relieved him so he could go get some rest. And within 15 minutes, that sergeant's life was lost. He was uh, taken out by a sniper's bullet. And my son began to relate to us all of the emotions that surrounded that event. He talked about the formation, the men standing in formation. He talked about what would be in the place where that sergeant would normally stand. He talked about the name being called three times in roll call they'd call through all the soldiers and this man's name was called three times and my son talked about the grief and those things began to flood my memory as we were sitting there listening to this army captain and army chaplain tell us that on that day it was my boy's name that was called three times and no Tim was 24 years old, blonde hair, blue eyes, loved the Lord. 
He was led to the Lord by a Marine. That Marine was his Sparky's leader. And, uh, and man, when Tim got saved, he got saved. Wasn't a perfect young man, uh, but, but knew the Lord, and there was fruit also that was a great comfort to us. But that's a rock in our sandbox. Now, some of you, you've gone through multiple things. Nobody gets out of the life without trauma. And so we, what we determined to do at the table that night, because I called a friend of mine, his name is Dan Davidson. I called Dan, uh, Dr. Davidson is the proper way I should address him. I called him, he's a great counselor. He's a great counselor. Such an encourager. And I called him and I said, hey, Brother Davidson, we just got news. That uh, We lost our boy and he's not coming home. And Dr. Davidson, he said, well, we're going to find out whether what you believe is true or not. I <laughs> thought, okay, Brother Davidson, thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> but he's right. He was right. He was right on the mark. He'd been through these things before. He was right on the mark. And we determined we're not going to ask why. We're not going to ask why. Because you know how we are. No matter what answer God gives, we can give him 50 ways he could have done it differently. So we're not going to ask him why. Instead, we're going to ask him what. What do you want us to do with this rock? Habakkuk had a rock in his sandbox, so to speak. God wasn't acting very godlike. And so what did Habakkuk do? He ran to his theology. He applied his theology to his situation. Some of the wrinkles were ironed out. Not all of them. What do you do then? You wait. You see what God's going to do. You don't abandon God. You don't abandon your theology. You don't turn your back on it. Instead, you wait and see what God's going to do. And in the end, you trust. You trust. And that four-year-old boy, he's been frustrated now for probably, I don't know, 20 minutes. And so his dad sees what's going on. And his dad walks over to him. And the boy's laying there. His eyes are closed. But he sees that shadow of his dad come over his face there. And he opens his eyes. And the dad says to his son, what's the matter? He says, Dad, there's a rock in my sandbox. I can't get the rock out. He said, have you tried everything? I've tried everything, Dad. Did you use your strength? I used my strength. I used my arms, used my legs. This rock is not budging. You used all your strength? Yeah, Dad, I used all my strength. The dad said, no, you did not. He said, yeah, Dad, I used all my strength. He says, did you ask me to move the rock? And the boy sat up and said, you would do that? He said, yeah, my strength is your strength. Well, Dad, would you move the rock? Well, the dad bent down, and it was a heavy rock, and he dug around a little bit, and you don't want the little boy to feel badly, so he wasn't just going to like flip over the side of the sandbox there. So he strained and struggled and sent it over on the other side, and the obstacle was dealt with. And the construction project began again. He that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, man, when we face a rock in our sandbox, when God is doing something that doesn't seem very godlike, we trust Him, and we rest in Him, and His strength becomes our strength. And we're able to face another day. We're able to move forward. And many of you even have this testimony. You would not go through those circumstances again for anything in the world. But you also emerge from those circumstances knowing God in a deeper way than you ever could have known Him without those dark times. Well, Habakkuk, are you going to trust the Lord? Look at the last chapter, chapter 3. And then the last three verses, verses 17, 18, and 19, we find out that Habakkuk trusted the Lord. It says here, although the fig tree shall not Blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herds in the stalls. Wow. Now it continues on, but he says, hey, there may be nothing in the field, no harvest. Those Chaldeans, they come and then they come in like a vacuum, man. They take all of the harvest. They take all of the livestock. All they leave there are remnants and ashes. It's, they were a terrible nation that way. And they would decimate their enemies. They would decimate those that they conquered. And so Habakkuk says, there may not be any crops in the fields. There may not be any herds in the stalls. But look what he says in verse 18. Yet I 
will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. There is in that region a little red deer. That's what they call it. And you know how sometimes God has made these amazing little creatures? Why? They are able to climb what looks like a sheer side of the hill. There's a little bit of an incline. They're, and they leap from rock to rock, not any fear for their safety at all. It's just an amazing thing to watch. And Habakkuk says, these mountains, God will make me conqueror over the mountains. They'll not be in my way, but I will instead by his strength climb over them. That's an amazing thing. In verse 18, did you see what he said? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I was looking at those words joy and rejoice, and I thought, well, they're kind of synonymous, except that because this book is inspired, there's never a wasted word. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what words he wants to use. And so every word is important. There's nothing super, superfluous. If there's something redundant, it's there for a reason. Joy and rejoicing. And so I was looking at those words, and I, I just love this. The word joy has as its root the meaning to leap. To leap. So joyous one leaps. And the word rejoice has at its root, <laughs> this is amazing, it has as its root the meaning to spin. Now, most of the time, our joy is kept on the inside. You know, it's just between me and the Lord. <laughs> I'm joyful. You know, that's what it is. We had somebody at church one day. Uh, she was a wonderful lady, wonderful servant, and I don't think she caught how she was saying it, but somebody talked to her about being mean, and she said, I am not mean. I am not an angry person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then we all just laughed, laughed about it, her included. So, but to joy, to joy so much, it comes out on the outside, there's leaping. Now, I have rarely leaped in my life. But there have been times when, um, when we invited a, a preacher to come preach, a preacher that I respected, and, and he said, yes, he was going to be able to come. And I was leaping for joy. It was just me in my office. Nobody else was looking, but leaping for joy. But then this idea of spinning, I think, I think of a little girl that twirls. You know, little, men don't twirl. We don't twirl. But please don't make me twirl. But, but to be so excited, to be so delighted in the Lord that it shows up on the outside, a bounce in the step, not because necessarily of our circumstances, but because of our God. And people will try to squelch that, won't they? They'll say, well, you must not understand how dire these circumstances are. And we replied, well, you must not understand how wonderful my God is. He's amazing, and he's mine, and I'm his, and there's joy in him. Mm. So sometimes God doesn't act very godlike. What do we do? All right, let's get back to what we know about God. He's good. He's faithful. He's right. He loves me. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. He does not mean to tear me down or destroy me, but instead he means to build me and conform me into the image of Christ. We take that, we apply it to our situation. Step two, apply it to the situation. And a lot of times the wrinkles get ironed out, but sometimes they don't. What do we do then? Oh, we watch and see what God is going to do. And he'll do something that will cause us to marvel, something we cannot wrap our brains around because then that gives him glory, something sometimes we can't even wrap our words around. It's indescribable. And what else will we do? We will trust. And even though there may not be any harvest in the fields, even though there may not be any herds in the stalls, they're still our God. And we will rejoice in Him. He is our portion. Listen carefully. God is not enough. He is more than enough. He is more than enough. And during those dark times, man, you know what it is to hold His hand to have him carry you at times. You know what it is to receive strength from his presence. There's a pain that's so deep. And many of you know what that is. That grief, we appreciate the sentiments, we appreciate the cards, we appreciate the hugs, we appreciate the tears, but it doesn't get to that deep down pain. But there is somebody that lives there. He's the Holy Spirit. 
and he comforts deep down. We will joy in our God. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you so much that Habakkuk is candid about his struggle. And thank you that you have preserved that for us in this old book. And that's for our edification. It's for our warning, but it's also for building us up. For some of us, we're going to take these truths and we're going to tuck them away. There'll be a trial at some point. There'll be a dark time at some point. And when that time comes, we'll go back to Habakkuk and we'll see how did he move through these things that just do not make sense. But Lord, for others, they know what it is to move through dark times. And they can testify, you were there. You didn't push them through and say, see you on the other side. You were right there, strengthening, comforting, guiding, loving. Lord, it may be that there's someone here tonight that's in the middle of a difficulty. And maybe they'd be encouraged by Habakkuk's example. Maybe they'd be encouraged to trust you, encouraged to trust you and to rejoice in you. Lord, Uh, It may be tonight there'd be somebody here who does not yet know the Savior as their own. And oh, they'll, they'll, they'll move through trials, but they move through them by themselves. They move through them, and, and there's just no direction. And there's, there's no ease. Many will, will resort to self, uh, self-anesthetizing. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll turn to something that will help dull the pain, they think. But as soon as that thing wears off, there's still the pain. Oh, may they come to Christ. Oh, may they put their faith and trust in Him and help us who know the Savior to put on display to others that our Savior is strong. It doesn't mean we don't grieve because we do. We just grieve with hope. It doesn't mean that we don't hurt because we do, but we don't hurt alone. May folks know that our God is real. He is there and He is worth following and He is more than enough. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I just, I'd be remiss if we didn't take the opportunity just to find out if you know the Lord tonight. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many of you have the testimony that you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Can I see your hand just lifted up high? Amen. I think you may put your hands down. And maybe you weren't able to raise your hand. And I just don't think we'd be doing our job as an evangelist, especially as a Christian in particular, that, that uh, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't give you the chance to respond to maybe God speaking to your heart. You'd say, man, I am not a Christian. I've not put my faith and trust in Christ. I've not received the Lord as my Savior. I don't know what the next five things to do, the next 10 things to do, but I tell you this, preacher, the next thing I need to do is to call on Christ to save me from my sin. Would you pray for me? Oh, I would. Would you put your hand up and we'll pray for you. We'll see that hand. We'll know to pray for you that you would come to Christ as your Savior You say, I don't know what it all looks like or anything, but I just know that's the next thing I need to do. Is that you? Can I see your hand? We'll pray for you. Dear Christian friend, it may be God speaking to your heart tonight. And it may be that he's speaking to your heart about being faithful through the difficult times, being faithful through the storms. Maybe he's talking to you tonight about once again getting to that place where he is your joy. And every once in a while, man, we'll allow idols to creep in there, things that we think will give us satisfaction I mean, we love the Lord, and we say, you know, Lord, I love you, you know, I, I love you, but, you know, to be really happy, I need this too. And maybe tonight we just say, okay, Lord, I, I need to get back to you. Get back to you. I need to trust you. I need to rest in you. Father, tonight, may you speak to our hearts. Perhaps there'd be some tonight in an old-fashioned altar call that would say, oh, dear Lord, I just need to get back to you. Lord, I... Uh, maybe some would say, Lord, I need to trust you in the midst of this storm. Thank you that you are so trustworthy. For some of us, we lay awake at night wondering about the what ifs. What if this happened? What if such and such happened? And we just worry ourselves, worry ourselves into a whirlwind. And we just need to trust you and lay it out before you and realize that should there be difficulties that come, you will give us the strength to weather those not just to weather them and survive, but to thrive through them. It doesn't mean that they're less painful. It doesn't mean that we're Pollyanna-like and sugarcoat everything. It just means we have the strength and the peace and the joy that only you can give in the middle of those things. 
Maybe tonight some of us just need to lay our situation out before you and say, oh, dear God, you know what I'm going through, and I don't have the strength for this, Lord, but I'm going to rest in you. Oh, may you be my strength. I'm going to trust you. May the people around me, they have a front row seat to see what I'm going through. May they see there's a real God in heaven who gives real strength to people who are struggling. Maybe tonight we just need to lay it all out before you, Lord. Have your way in this invitation time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand together. We're going to sing, take up that cross and follow me. And Pastor, we'll just turn it over to you as well. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. He drew me closer to his side. I sought his will to know. And in that will I now abide. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. So wherever he leads, I'll go. If you have a prayer request tonight, you can write that down in one of the slips in front of the hymn book, and our ushers will pick those up from you while you're writing those down. We enjoyed that message tonight. Amen. Amen. That was a powerful message. Praise the Lord. We're so glad that you came to be here with us, brother. Let me remind you of several announcements while you're writing those prayer uh, requests down. You're still having that camp meeting tonight? Where are you going to meet with them? Right down here, a camp meeting. Uh, for those in that uh, are going to put their kids in junior camp, and the right after the service tonight, right up here in the front. Then uh, next Sunday is Father's Day, and uh, we have a special gift for every father here, special Father's Day message. I hope that you'll be here uh, for that. Of course, Wednesday night in the book of Proverbs, I encourage you to be here in God's house on Wednesday night. Now, we preached about that today. We glorify the Lord. Amen? We glorify God when we're in. Uh, when we come to God's house, I hope that you'll be here on Wednesday night. Uh, on the 24th, for our Sunday school, old-time religion Sunday, old-time breakfast, each Sunday school class, we're going to dress in old-fashioned duds, it says right there in the bulletin. So I hope that you'll do that. It'll be fun. VBS, the prizes. We need 2,000 prizes for VBS. We have a big Bible school looking for many souls to be saved. And so uh, we encourage you, go to the dollar store, pick those up, and bring those. And there will be a place in the kitchen that you can, uh, there will be a container in there you can put those in. We need to start collecting those. And Vacation Bible School will be coming up on July the 23rd through Wednesday. That's Monday through Wednesday the 25th, Soul Wars. And uh, we're looking forward to a great Bible school again this year. You know what's sad is that many churches are not having Bible school anymore. They think it's too much work, so they're just not doing it anymore. It just isn't that a sad day that we're living that they don't even do Bible school. Every church used to have Bible school, but no longer. But we we still have Bible school. We're going to get souls saved. Then uh, anniversary Sunday. 
our 40th church anniversary, and Hope Children's Home will be here. We'll have a great day, dinner on the grounds that day. Uh, we have, I have a special gift. I'm going to give one of these to every, every person that day. It's got a, our uh, church information on there, 1998 through 2018, 40 years. It's hard to believe 40 years have gone by, just slid right by. But uh, we're trusting the Lord for many more years here at Liberty Baptist Church. I hope that you'll invite someone to come on that day. We'll have some of the families that have moved away. Hopefully they'll be coming on that day. And uh, Jeremy Rowland, Baptist Church Planting Ministry, grew up in our church and is out planting churches. He'll be here with us. My children from all across the country will be here. So we're looking forward to a great, great day on that day. Begin inviting people before you know it. It'll be here, won't it? it? Before you know it, it will be here. Here's, some, here's a prayer request that was just given to me. Austin Taylor, seven years old, leukemia. This is Deborah Fortosis, one of her clients. So please pray. Yeah. Pastor Young, over at Sawyer Road Baptist Church, I was told tonight that he was put in hospice. Been there for, I know, he was there before I started this church 40 years ago, probably 50 years. I would, I would say he's been there 50 years at that church. Not a very big church, very small, small church. But uh, uh, we need to pray about that. I, I don't know. I'm, uh, Lord willing, I'll try to get by and see him this week if I can and see what's going on. I don't know if they have any provisions. I don't know what's going on whatsoever but a very, very small, small congregation over there. It's right on Sawyer Road. And, uh, and so we need to pray, pray for them. Okay. Let's all stand. We're going to sing. We'll be dismissed, and we'll be on our way. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. God bless you, you're dismissed. We'll have the camp meeting on this side, actually, so we don't have to deal with the orchestra instruments.